Thus far, in our theme for this month, the feelings of Christmas, we've talked about Zachariah's feeling of disbelief and Mary's feelings of belief, both of which manifest themselves in their response to the good news brought to them by the angel Gabriel. Today, we will turn our attention to another character who played a role in the narrative of that first Christmas 2,027 years ago. That character plays a very important supporting character role. Each year during the Academy Awards, an Academy Award is given to the best actor in a supporting role. A supporting actor is an actor who performs a role in a play or film below that of the leading actors and above that of bit parts. In recognition of the important nature of this work, the theater and film industries give separate awards to the best supporting actors and actresses. Robert Duvall has been nominated for four such awards, and Tommy Lee Jones has been nominated for three such awards. If an Academy Award was given for the best supporting actor in the Christmas narrative, it certainly would have gone to Joseph. Mary played the lead role, for she gave birth to Jesus. All generations count her as blessed, and the Gospel according to John tells us she was even present at Jesus' crucifixion. Whereas even though Joseph played a crucial, obedient, supporting role, he faded out of the Gospel narrative after the temple incident when Jesus was 12. You've almost likely heard the phrase, whose origin is unknown, but it predates 1945, behind every great man there is a great woman. Well, with respect to the Christmas narrative, behind Mary stood a compassionate, obedient man of God who received not one message from God as Zacharias and Mary did, but four messages from God. He didn't allow his ego, the morality laws handed down from Moses, shame or peer pressure to dictate his feelings, which manifest themselves in an attitude of obedience. Could the same be said of you? With that in mind, let us consider our text for today, Matthew 1, verse 18 through chapter 2, verse 23. But before we read the text, let me take a moment and tell you a little bit about the historical context. And, uh, ancestrally, Joseph was a descendant of King David's son Solomon, through the gospel, per the gospel according to Matthew. Mary was a descendant of King David's son Nathan, according to the gospel according to Luke. Jesus was the fulfillment of God's covenant with King David, recorded in 2 Samuel 7, whereby God said to David through the prophet Nathan, Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Jesus was also the fulfillment of God's covenant with Abraham, as recorded in Genesis 12, 3, whereby God said to Abraham, And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Herod the Great was the governor of Galilee from 47 to 37 B.C. In 37 B.C., Anthony Octavius and the Roman Senate designated him king of Judea, which he ruled until his death in Jericho in the spring of 4 B.C. Herod's reign was characterized by domestic problems. Many of the problems came because he had ten wives, each wanting their son to succeed him. As a result of his domestic problems, he had written six wills, the sixth only five days before his death. It is against this background of palace intrigue that Jesus was born in 6 or 5 B.C. Now that we have an understanding of the historical context, let us consider the actual text. That is Matthew 1, verse 18, through chapter 2, verse 23. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord 
through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her as a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way. And the, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left their own country by another way. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up! Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all the vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what God had, had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramal, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, he took the child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea and placed his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, unlike the gospel according to Luke, which elevates the importance of women, the gospel according to Matthew, written by one of Jesus' original 12 disciples, who was Jewish, was written from a traditional Jewish perspective. For a Jewish audience. For example, <clears throat> he starts out the gospel with the genealogy of Joseph in accordance with Jewish tradition, which considers the father's lineage the most important. In addition, the author uh, practically elevates Joseph to the lead role by speaking to his actions primarily and practically ignores Mary's role. And after taking 17 verses to point out the genealogy of Joseph, he then, in one verse, points out the big however. That is, that Joseph wasn't the father of Mary's baby, the Holy Spirit was. Nonetheless, Matthew has provided us with valuable insight into Joseph's feelings that first Christmas and how those feelings manifested themselves in an attitude of obedience. As you can see in our text for today, Joseph received 
Not one message from God, as Zacharias and Mary did by way of the angel Gabriel, but four messages from God by way of dreams. We'll begin our discussion with message number one in chapter one, verses 19 to 25. Verse 19 speaks to Joseph's character and feelings. He was a righteous man, and it would appear his righteousness wasn't based on blind obedience to Jewish morality law, for if so he wouldn't have had, he would have had Mary stoned to death. But rather, his righteousness was based on the intent of the law, that is, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. For he didn't want to disgrace her and plan to send her away secretly. Have you ever been betrayed by the one you loved? Then you can imagine the feelings that welled up within Joseph when he found out his fiancée, Mary, was with child. I would imagine his mind was going a million miles an hour, grieving the loss of his plans, fighting feelings of betrayal, shame, and uncertainty. I would imagine he had many sleepless nights, but yet he was able to see past those feelings, to see past his ego, to see past the letter of the morality law recorded in Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 24, to see past the shame, and to see past the peer pressure to love. He allowed his feelings to be informed by his faith and had arrived at a plan that would not disgrace Mary. How about you? Do you allow your faith to inform your feelings? Then in verse 20, having decided how he would proceed, it appears Joseph was able to sleep. And it was at this point that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Can you relate to this dilemma? Have you ever been so busy trying to figure out a problem for yourself that the indecision in and of itself distracts you from hearing the still small voice of God? But when you finally make a decision and rest, you can hear the still small voice of God. Such was the case with Joseph. The angel of the Lord came to him in a dream to reassure him, to confirm what Mary had been telling him, and to command him. How did Joseph respond to the dream? With an attitude of obedience. Verse 24 tells us that when he awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. He didn't let anything stand in the way of his obedience. He stepped out on faith and trust in God. In essence, in the words of the song, I am, by the newsboys, his actions responded, I am holding on to you. Which brings us to message number two in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 2. The Magi have come into the house and seen the child of Mary, and they've fallen to the ground and worshipped him, and they've presented him with three very valuable gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they have headed home. The excitement being over, Joseph is sleeping, and once again, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream, this time urgently commanding him, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Such a command would be like somebody hollering, hollering, the building's on fire, get out! How did Joseph respond to the dream? With an attitude of obedience. Verse 13 tells us he got up and took the child his mother while, he was, while it was still night and left for Egypt. It would appear the valuable gifts provided the means for them to live in Egypt. Once again, he stepped out on faith and trust in God's manifesting an attitude of obedience. Once again, his actions responded, I am holding on to you. Which brings us to message number three in chapter two, verses 19 to 21. It is now the spring of 4 BC and Herod has died. Once again, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream while they were in Egypt. This time, the angel advised Joseph that Herod had died and commanded him to get up and take the child and his mother back into the land of Israel. How did Joseph respond to this third dream? With an attitude of obedience. He stepped out on faith and trust in God, manifesting an attitude of obedience. Once again, his actions responding, I am holding on to you. Which brings us to the fourth message. Chapter 2, verses 22 to 23. 
Joseph, the child of Mary, have crossed the border into the land of Israel. And they have heard Herod's son, Archelaus, is king over Judea. As such, Joseph is afraid to go there. That is, Joseph is instinctively afraid. It is a self-preservation type of fear, an emotion meant to preserve life. Once again, he is warned by God in a dream and is obedient. This time he left for the regions of Galilee and settled in a city called Nazareth. Once again, he stepped out on faith and trusted in God, manifesting an attitude of obedience. Once again, his actions responding, I am holding on to you. The priest Zacharias responded with disbelief when Gabriel delivered the good news personally that God was going to answer his prayers for a child. The Virgin Mary responded with belief when Gabriel delivered the good news personally that miraculously Mary would conceive and give birth to the Son of God. Joseph responded with obedience when upon four separate occasions an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and commanded him to take an action. He stepped out on faith and trusted God, his, ad his attitude manifesting itself in obedience. He didn't let his ego, the morality law, shame, peer pressure, exhaustion, or fear stand in the way of his obedience. How about you? Do you step out on faith and trust God in all circumstances? Or do you allow things of this world to stand in the way of your obedience, such as entertainment, other commitments, pride, self-centeredness, others, fear, self-doubt, or material possessions? In accordance with the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph's feelings manifest themselves in an attitude of obedience. That is, in the middle of the storm, he was holding on to God, trusting in his plan. Could Matthew write the same about you? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may our hearts and minds be at rest that we might hear your still small voice. May our feelings be renewed such that our words and our actions manifest themselves in an attitude of obedience to the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. May you have a blessed week, and hopefully you can join us again for the next part of our sermon series on the feelings of Christmas, which will be available on Christmas Eve. When God calls you home, may Jesus greet you with, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you.